we are going to get started. But uh, yeah, thanks for coming, everyone. Thank you all for being here. We have a surprise <laughs> guest, science husband. Yes, yeah, so this is Scott Bannister. And maybe that'll make sense to why it's exciting that he's here in a moment. Yes, yes. Other than just being my husband. Yes. <laughs> um, so I'd love to get started um, maybe with like quick introductions. Sometimes we ask people to give two introductions. The first introduction would be Cyan and Scott when y'all were around the ages of 18, 19, or 20. How you would have introduced yourself if you were you know, sitting in a room like this. And the second introduction would be the Cyan and Scott today. Well, I think what would be great to start with is how you used to sneak into these rooms when you were that age. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'll, rather than an introduction from then, I'll just say a little bit about who I was at that time. Um, I, uh, I went to the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. I was studying computer science. Um, and I ended up uh, starting a couple of companies while I was there. Um, and one of them failed, and then the one that survived, I took with me, and I left college early, merged it with another company, and that's kind of a separate, longer story. But, um, but when I did that, I had no particular reason to be there anymore, so I moved actually to Palo Alto. Um, but I was still college-aged, and so I actually got on all these email lists here at Stanford and whenever events were being, I mean, this probably had the same sort of thing, right? You sort of promiscuously probably sent it out to some mailing list and what have you. And so I would see all those invitations and then I would actually show up to events like this. Um, so everyone here may not be affiliated with Stanford, just so, just so you know. Um, there, may be, uh, there may be spies from, from other universities. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll just leave it there for now. Awesome. Awesome. I think if I were 18, is that what you said? Yeah. Um, I would look at all of you and ask you why the hell I'm here. You know, I was homeless. And uh, I didn't go to college and I dropped out of high school. And so when I was 18, I was part of the workforce. And even walking into this room, it's very alien to me. I was just like, wow, this is such a foreign environment. But it's exhilarating. Like, I'm excited to be here. I'd love uh, to, for you to share a little bit more about that story and how you got to where you are today from sure. a unique childhood. Yeah, so I started some little businesses and you know, before, prior to doing that, I had a really negative view on capitalism. And I, you know, I just didn't know a whole lot about the world and so my, my views on it were pretty limited. But I can tell you that what lifted me up out of poverty was absolutely without a doubt capitalism. And I started making t-shirts, I started making patches, I started making just necklaces, anything that I could make and sell to the public. And you know, it, one of the things I like to talk to people about is incrementalism, which is, you know, um, there's no easy path really to greatness, like there's all these little paths. And so I would always make games out of these things. Uh, I would, you know, revenue games, uh, new client games. There were just always these games. And it made life interesting, and it made it tolerable. Um, and then I started seeing customers out walking around wearing stuff that I made, and that was really powerful. But eventually, you know, that led to a type of freedom in which you know, there's, there's certain basic core needs that we need, which is a roof over our head, and, and food, and stability. And once you have those, then you can start to dream. And I don't think that I thought I could be an entrepreneur until I met this guy, um, which we can get to that in a little bit. But um, one thing led to another where I fell into a group of hacker kids. And that's probably the most pivotal point in my life where I was hanging out with sort of these punk rock, you know, homeless kids. And then I started hanging out with all these hacker computer engineer people. And they started bringing me to all of these conferences. And I started realizing that that was my calling in life was working with anything and everything that had to do with computer technology. And how did the two of y'all meet? Ah, why don't you tell the story? Uh, sure, so yeah, just to pick up my story, um, I basically ended up through a series of mergers, we sold that resulting company to Microsoft, um, and, and then uh, I ended up later starting a company called Ironport Systems, which ended up being uh, mostly known for being an anti-spam company. And uh, Cyan actually came to work there at some yeah. point when we were about, what, 30 people or something? We were about 30 people or so. Yeah. Um, and so 
Yeah, so we ended up meeting, you know, through uh, through work, I guess, which is, I guess, taboo now. I don't, I don't know if that's even allowed, but um, it's too bad if it's not. But um, um, yeah, that's that's how we met. Worked out great. Yeah, that's great. How long ago was that? Uh, 2003. Uh, yeah. And so we worked together for a while, and. <clears throat> And uh, it was him that actually decided that I would be good at what I do now. And uh, he identified it. Tell us more about that. What did you identify? And So yeah, so after, after we sold Ironport to Cisco, um, I had been making angel investments kind of before then. And um, I decided to sort of dedicate myself more directly to just being an angel investor. And that's what I was going to do next. Um, and. Uh, I basically, it's, it, and, and Cyan at the time was like, I don't know, some, somehow she was kind of in the periphery of what I was doing. Um, and I said, you know, I think you would be really, you would be really good at this. Like you should, you should do this, you should do this with me. Like you need, you need to, to, uh, if you, if you focused on meeting the right people and, and helping us, you know, do deals. Uh, both source deals and, and evaluate deals, um, then I think you know we could be more successful together than I would be separately. Yeah, I honestly wouldn't have considered this as a career path. Uh, I'm an accidental VC, and you know I think that it really sometimes it takes somebody identifying that you have a skill and, and giving you that confidence that you could do that. And this was long before. I mean, when we got, when I got into this, there were very few angel investors. And now there's early stage investors and angel investors. I, there's probably thousands at this point. There's so much competition. Um, so I feel extraordinarily lucky to have entered the field when it was just sort of uh, um, the wild frontier, so to speak. Yeah, you, it used to be um, that what now is considered the time when pe people raise money from angel investors for their seed round or whatever, and sometimes even from seed funds. Um, there was there was something that was known as the friends and family round, right? And so that was you know pretty much everyone when they were starting a company that was kind of that was kind of what you did. And there might be people in your network that might write investment checks, but they might not. You know, it probably wasn't their identity. You know, mm -hmm. writing writing checks into in small companies, um, and then that became kind of a, an industry unto itself. And, and, and so you all have invested in PayPal, SpaceX. Um, Postmates, um, what else am I missing? I know a bunch. Uber. Uber. Thumbtack. Carta. Uh, DeepMind. Deep, deep um, I mean, at this point, we don't really, it's funny because we get asked this question all the time, but we, we have a sort of philosophy of set it and forget it. We, once you have a conviction about a company, we get involved and we don't really have like, I see people with their amazing spreadsheets and stuff and I mean, you have spreadsheets, but I don't. And, <laughs> but you know, it's like one of these things where sometimes we don't even know all the companies we've done. But there's a lot. And I, I was, we were, we were um, with someone earlier who complimented you a lot and said that you are the best angel investor. Maybe y'all are the best angel investors out there. Um, and everyone thinks you're really crazy when you make a, a, an investment. But then five years later, they start to realize that, that y'all were right. I'm curious. In 2028. 20, what do you think the world will look like? What are some hot takes that y'all have that oh, gosh. you know controversial? I hot hate takes. hot takes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think AI has got everyone in the world uncomfortable at the moment. It's it's one of these things where you wonder, as an entrepreneur or as an investor or anybody in the world, like even in the Uber car that I was in earlier today, they're wondering like how this is going to impact their family or them or it's the talk at you know everywhere I go in coffee shops uh, in Hollywood. There, there's a writer's strike going on and people are wondering like how how is this going to impact writing and art and you know so I think probably one of the most disruptive things in our lifetime more disruptive maybe than the printing press and things like that is going to be AI and I think you know uh, I'm some of the the greatest minds that I look up to right now some of our LPs when I asked them I was like well what do you see for the future and, and they're like I'm drawing blanks so my hot take right now is that nobody seems to know what's going to happen and it's a very uncomfortable period, I think, because it's exciting. Because it, when you have periods like this, it's really a time to innovate, and it's a time to, 
you know, stretch out of that comfort zone that you have, but, but gosh, we're, we're entering in an era like we've never seen before. So I wish I had a hot take, but I really don't. I don't, I don't have, like, I'm testing the weather signs and I'm not seeing anything. Scott? Um, I mean, I guess if I'm going to put something out there, I would just say that, you know, the software industry will continue uh, uh, with or without AI, you know, there will continue to be all the same sorts of opportunities that have been there for the last 20, 30, however many years. Um, and, uh, you know, those opportunities don't stop existing just because there's some new, you know, technological innovation, right? So there may be really great, you know, boring pieces of enterprise software that people should still go build, whether whether you can put AI in your in, in your PowerPoint deck or not, you know, it doesn't necessarily doesn't necessarily matter. Yeah. How did the two of y'all work amongst your partnership when you, you know, went to invest in a company? Is there an optimist and a pessimist? Mm -hmm. Is there a, a who challenges who and what does that look like? I would say I'm the optimist. Um, you are optimist pessimist. But I think how we work and what's beautiful about our relationship is that um, I like to fly by the seat of my pants, and I like to live in the moment. I like to be very present, and he enables me to do so by taking on the back office and the various functions of that role that I don't particularly enjoy that you seem to like. So when it comes to like legal documents, um, even thinking through some of the harder you know, spreadsheet economic questions that I don't want to dig into. I, I worked at a fund where we did growth investing and it, I just felt like it, my soul was going to die. And, and so I really like this stage and I like being paired with someone like him. And also Lee Jacobs is the same, who's um, my partner at Long Journey. I, I have to be, it's one of those things where you realize your core competencies and you realize what you're good at and you realize what you're not good at. I have to be paired with someone who has a bit of discipline because I can be very undisciplined. Don't you think? Sometimes. <laughs> Anything to add? Um, no, I think that was a good summary. Cool. I want to talk He's about. Like, yes, she can. Yeah. <laughs> good answer. Um, I want to talk about kind of like making your own luck. And uh, you know, you left school. Uh, what year what was it when you left? Uh, I left in '96. Yeah, it was what, what? Was that a freshman year or something? Uh, that was my sophomore year. Sophomore year. Yeah. You left high, high school. Yeah. So, sophomore year. Sophomore year. Um, I'd love for you to all just share, you know, kind of stories back then and then today on how you want to make your own luck or how, you know, the steps you do to do that. Well, I think we have this concept inside of our minds that all good ideas are ours. And we have this ego that drives us that basically says that anything that happens that is good in our lives was a result of how smart we are or whatever else. But to be honest with you, I've, I've come as I get older to realize that a lot of that is false. Uh, we do make our own luck by having an optimistic attitude and a passion and a curiosity for the world around us. One of the things Scott and I like to talk about is in order to be a really great investor, you must really care about your fellow man and woman, human. You have to really care about you know, all of the investments that we've done when I look thematically across them, they, 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 they were a shift in human behavior, a lot of them. Like if you look at Uber, it was, I'm going to get in a stranger's car and they're going to use this asset and drive me to another place and I'm gonna somehow trust that's all gonna work out. And when we took that deal to multiple firms, multiple VCs, the excuses that we heard were the system isn't working, the car doesn't come to our house or you know, it's dangerous stranger danger, like all of those sorts of things. And so, you know, one might fold under that sort of feedback and say, I'm not a good investor, or I don't know, I won't trust my gut. And you really have to, in the face of that, fight through it and maintain that curiosity and optimism, because I think, I think that's where luck lives. If you're pessimistic and you don't go out the door and you, you're basically, it's a self-fulfilling destiny. Like you're just basically saying I'm closed. I was having this, this discussion with a friend yesterday about optimistic investors versus pessimistic ones. I think pessimistic ones will end up doing less deals, but be right about them potentially. Um, optimists will do more deals and be wrong about more and they'll end up probably in roughly the same place. But I, I would say that it's a better place to live if you're more excited about what you're doing versus not excited. So 
I think creating more luck um, is about perception. But anyway, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think um, one of the things that worked for me was sort of bias, biasing myself towards action. Um, uh, one of the specific things that I did was I um, actually joined quite a few boards of directors when um, you know, I probably had no business being on the board of directors of that particular company in terms of my knowledge about the business and, 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 and the space. Um, uh, but I sort of did it anyway because I figure I would learn as I go along. And so I think a lot of life is about learning as you go along um, and not thinking that learning was like some static thing that you did. It was like, oh, you know, until I was this age, you know, I was spending my time learning stuff and now it's time to execute or something like that. That's just not, that's just not how it works, right? Like you just, you're constantly learning, but you have to expose yourself to things in order, in order to learn. So I think I sort of biased myself towards, towards that. And what today are you trying to learn more of? And what today, where, where is your curiosity guiding you? I'm learning Morse code. I know that's weird, but um, I have this dream that someday I'm going to look out across the hills and there's going to be a flashing light and I'm going to be the one unique person that's like going to respond. Um, I learn weird stuff like that. I don't know where it's going to lead, uh, but if I have like a curious inclination, inclination about something, I go deep down the rabbit hole and I don't know where it's going to lead. Like this might, I might become a ham radio operator in an store. You know, I mean, I'm always into something like baseball cards, basketball cards, you know, these help you make, like, if, if you get into baseball cards or basketball cards, you might run across a whatnot and have to make a decision about whether or not you want to invest in that. And maybe you might realize, oh, it's actually the verification of PSA and Beckett, you know, verifying cards that's actually the more interesting market segment to go after. I really honestly feel like you kind of, in my, my way, I don't know about you, but I like to be kind of like a method actor investor where I get really deep into the weeds of what people, how they use something, and then I figure out where the investable opportunities are there. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I do is I, um, I try to leverage our past investments as both um, something that I can try to be helpful with, but also that I learn something by interacting with those, with those companies. Right, so it, it creates sort of an attachment to the world that we get to see a lot of things that are happening, and to some extent, you get to see them sort of behind the scenes. Right, you don't just see you know what's being written in, in in the press. You can kind of see, okay, you know these sorts of companies are now responding to these sorts of technologies by making these sorts of changes to their business plan. You know what have you, um, and. Uh, Again, you just try, try to leverage whatever you have, just try to leverage it to, to, to learn, I think. Yeah, got it. And I'm curious, like, you know, the room is, is, is filled with people that are just getting started on their kind of entrepreneurial journeys, um, tinkering on stuff. What have you learned as, like, the biggest mistakes that people have made oh. when kind of just getting started? What are the... The first one is a relationship with a co-founder. Uh, most companies will fall apart due to lack of communication with your co-founder. So if you're teaming up with a group of people, like sorting out what equity ownership is what, and a lot of times we'll see people figure that out when it's time to raise money, and then then, then you start thinking about value, and, and what did you do, and what did I do, and then the elbows get sharp, and that's usually when it falls apart. So I think picking your co-founder carefully, and it's just like any marriage or relationship you're in, like you should really sit down and say, this is my user manual, what's your user manual, like how do you like to solve disputes, you know, who's the 51% owner or majority owner of the company that's actually going to make decisions? So I think one of the things I look for when I'm, I'm doing a pitch, uh, number one, if they have a co-founder, like how do they resolve disputes? And it's amazing to me, how, it doesn't matter how great your idea is, how, what great technology you have, if you can't manage people or work with other people, you're just dead in the water. So. Uh, I think that's probably number one piece of advice I would give is just pick your co-founder wisely. Yeah, I, I would say generically, I think the reason why most companies fail, um, I mean, yes, you may just, the market may not work out for you, but um, 
the really sad situations are when the market really was there and it fails due to people issues, mm -hmm. right? And the people issues may end up causing you to not execute properly, but it may be even more dire where, you know, the, the, the founders, you know, can't, can't agree. And, you know, there's just a, lo a lot of, you know, people are very complex. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that aspect of the business um, tends to be why, why a lot of businesses ultimately fail, even though when it fails, everyone tries to sort of point a finger somewhere else. It's like, oh, we were too early or, you know, it turns out there was not a market for what we were doing or what have you. But the reality is a, a, a startup is kind of like you've all just decided to get into a boat and then you're really just kind of out on the open seas trying to figure out what to do. Like you could have done anything with that boat, right? You could have pursued any market. You could have pursued any customers. You could have changed your product, thrown out your previous product, or built a new product, right? So it really was, it was a boat with some people in it. And you had the opportunity on the open seas with a certain amount of fuel that you raised from some investors or what have you. And if that didn't work out, like probably had something to do with- You, you might know, have had a mutiny. Yeah, there was something, something went wrong, you know, right. with, with, with the-, the, the well, Which we've seen many Interpersonal mutinies. things. Many, many mutinies. Yeah. Uh, where your employees, uh, there's lots of management mistakes that people make like a lot of entrepreneurs uh i mean one of the beautiful things about being an entrepreneur is you don't know what you don't know and so being uh naive to the realities of of what it's like to operate a business that has 100 people 200 people 300 people and then growing and then all of these executives potentially that you might have someday um, is a beautiful thing but also a double-edged sword because sometimes you're thrust into these things and you have to pretend and act like you know what you're doing going back to you've got to learn on, on the fly. So you have to learn to become the best CEO or CTO or COO. Sometimes you gotta, you really just kind of have to make it up. How, how do you think about disagreeable people uh, in general or people, you know, not, you know, I imagine Travis Kalanick was difficult to work with, was disagreeable, same with some of the kind of PayPal team. Um, how, how, do you, how do you think about? Yeah, I've worked with a lot of the PayPal team at this point, so have you. Um, and I think being disagreeable can be a gift. I think, uh, and it takes a certain type of culture and the type of people that you have around you for that to work. So it worked at Uber until it didn't, right? Like when you, Travis had to fight regulators and had to fight deeply entrenched systems to rip out medallion systems from taxi drivers. And it does not, that is not for the meek. That is not for someone who's just gonna roll over. And so you did need that aggressive behavior. You did need a type of culture that was just like, we're going to win at all costs. But what the problem was, right when they were nearing going public, there was never a course correction of we are winning, so let's act like we're winning. You know, it was, it was, you know, it was still very cutthroat. And I think that culture kind of cannibalized itself. And it's a, it's a really a shame. I mean, Uber is still very successful and it's a great company, but, you know, I would argue that maybe Travis being at the helm might have been better. Uh, but that's a management issue, and I wasn't in the boardroom, and and I wasn't part of the conversations. But my my imagination is that he would have been. I'm a big believer that the soul of the company should stay as long as possible. You know that when you take out the founder, the person who had the original vision, which would have been him, Garrett, and I guess Ryan Graves. Yeah. Um, you are you're potentially killing what made it a golden goose in the first place. And so you have to be really careful about those decisions and, and not make them lightly. And I'm sure it was a tough decision for Benchmark to make. But, you know, uh, was he absolutely the right entrepreneur at the right time? Absolutely. So we work with lots of difficult people. I mean, that's what makes entrepreneurs sometimes who they are. They can't work for other people. And so by nature, they're difficult. Like, you're very difficult. This man cannot work for anybody. Um, and you know Keith Rabboy is difficult. Peter Thiel is difficult. Max Lepchin is difficult. I don't think any of you are not difficult. And so you have to like get pretty comfortable dealing with neurodiversity. Uh, like sometimes people prescribe malice to situations or difficultness as it's like, and sometimes it's just about trying to get to the best answer. It's not you know it's not to be in the feels of the situation. It's actually to logic your way to the right conclusion can sometimes be uncomfortable, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to you know, touch on like the, the, you know, starting a company is super hard. You never know like when so something will start to work. How, how have you experienced people deciding 
whether or not to pivot or just keep going and keep kind of trying a new you know, variation of uh, uh, you know, said problem. I've seen all kinds of things from perfect is the enemy of good. I will start with that one, which is you have this product and you won't release it to the public because it has to be perfect. You know, that ends up being an issue. I've seen that many times. Um, there's, you know, I have product market fit and I think I'm on to something, but then there's nothing there and not knowing when to realize that there was nothing there. So like, for example, high growth consumer startups, I can't tell you how many we've invested in that had hundreds of millions of users that ended up going to nothing um, because it doesn't have a hook. It doesn't have something sticky for those people to stay there. Um, and then you have the people who refuse it's a sunk cost fallacy. They, they won't pivot when they need to. Um, and then there's these amazing entrepreneurs who are just like, you know, I really wanted to do this, but it's not working, so I'm going to do this other thing. And as an investor, you have to be okay with that. Because you have to say, like, I was in the boat with you, and I'm in the boat with you, and you've just decided to go do this crazy thing that I don't want to spend time on intellectually. But you're still an, an investor. You're in the boat. And so you have to get used to all of these. Life is not static. It's unpredictable, and startups are just as unpredictable. Yeah, I, th I think um, there are examples of companies that succeeded, obviously because the, the company pivoted, and there are examples where they succeeded because they stuck to it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's hard to know, absent having hindsight, exactly which direction to take. And partly it just ends up being, you know, that's why we don't have the government sort of like allotting people, you know, slots to go build companies, right? Like there's however many, you know, if you can go raise some money, go build a company and we'll see, you know, a thousand flowers will bloom or die or turn into trees or, you know, whatever, whatever will happen, right? So um, I think that we have, um, uh, there's sort of an attitude diversity that you get where there will be people that will really stick to it and there'll be people that really pivot quickly. And um, those can all be pathways to success and they can all be pathways to failure, right? Sorry, you guys go Oh, I've seen people pivot too quickly even. Like there was a period of time that was really hot. It was like the thing um, where you would just throw spaghetti against the wall and if it didn't stick immediately, you just built something else. And they would never even give it the time of day to stick. So that's the other thing is like sometimes you need a few more weeks of that experiment. But they were just like, oh, that didn't work. I don't have a million users today. So on to the next thing. And so I've seen all types. And that rarely works out. But every now and then you might hit lightning in a bottle. You might build an HQ trivia, for example. You know, HQ trivia is a really great example of founders who couldn't get along. And that company, no matter what documentary you watch, um, it was founder disagreement at the end of the day. It was two people who should have gotten along that didn't that tanked that company. How do you all think about incrementalism for yourselves today? Um, what game level do you want to advance to next? Hmm. I don't know, are you into incrementalism like me? I mean, I, th I think now where we've actually become both um, pretty deeply spiritual and, um, and I think there's an incrementalism in that. Um, I don't know if you want to talk more about yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, but. I've started realizing, so if you go back to my origin story of who I am, I dropped out of high school. I didn't read very many books. I'm self-educated, but most of the books I did read were coding books or sysadmin books or anything to do with Unix at the time. And, and so a lot of literature, I just didn't read it. I never thought it was important. I actually thought the English language was just whatever. And I recently have come to the conclusion that actually I was wrong about a lot of that. And so I'm learning Hebrew. I'm learning, um, you're learning Greek-ish. Very badly. Badly. We're both learning it badly. But I think that part of this is so that we can understand literature that we're reading on a more profound and deeper level than we did before. And so the two of us, I mean, one of the discussions we were having earlier is like, what is the implication of spirituality in the world of AI? And you know, will there be, I know this might be controversial, but will there be a Christ AI? Will there be like, um, you know, a Muslim AI? Will there be, I mean, my guess is yes. And so this is something that we have been pondering and thinking about, but 
I think from, I, incrementalism is just who I am. I mean, it's just built into me every day. So every day I've got an internal game. I don't share them with people usually, but like for example, I'm trying to find four leaf clovers. Like, so if you see me wandering around looking like I've lost my mind staring at the ground, I'm not looking for contacts. I'm trying to find a four leaf clover. So, and by the way, just as an aside, can I tell you guys how to find a four leaf clover? Okay, so if you're in a patch of four leaf clovers, you're clovers. Gonna, Clovers, yeah. oh, sorry, three-leaf clovers, looking for a four-leaf clover, yes. You will look for triangles because that's what your mind thinks you're looking for, but you're actually looking for a square. And I actually think that there's something beautiful about that, which is if you're looking for a square but you don't know you're looking for a square, you're never going to find it. So the moment you train your mind to find the squares, they start appearing everywhere. And then suddenly you become this magician of four-leaf clovers, and it's just a cool trick to play with your friends. But it's also really fun to do with entrepreneurs. So. I take entrepreneurs on these walks and, and I've started taking pitches that way and it's really fascinating to see how they would think through the problem of finding a four leaf clover because people come up with all sorts of, of things and it's a really beautiful way to see can someone be present, can they hang, can they do something weird, can they, can they go there with you? And so I like to come up with fun things like that. I try to integrate my job with my passion for learning and as seamless as that can be, the better. So that's what I strive for. What are some creative uh, walks you've been on? I mean, the four leaf clover one is, is amazing. Like, if you're stopping to stare at the world, the world is profoundly beautiful. And so it, it's endless. Like, you'll run into hummingbirds, you'll run into skateboarders, you'll run into, you know, your neighbor that maybe you've never met or discover there's a school down the street with students in it. and. You know, it, it's, there's no telling where that rabbit hole goes. And a lot of people look at this and they're like, how does this relate? I've had so many investors and engineers and people tell me, like, it looks like you're wasting time. But you can't argue with the results. Right? You can't argue with how well I've done. And I think part of it is this magical wonder of, of wondering how everything works and its place in the world and that leads you to these opportunities, including what company to start. Like, you might find it that way. What have you all learned from each other? Oh, so much. How to not fight. <laughs> Just kidding. This is our date night, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think one of, the, one of the reasons why I pulled Cyan into this business was um, I saw how she uh, was an early adopter of consumer apps. And this was at a time when apps was kind of a new thing and like the iPhone was new and everything. And, and I was still like using my Blackberry and refusing to buy an iPhone. And, um, and she's just very uh, active, I guess going back to the bias I try to have, but yet I don't use it all the time. She was very active in the consumer internet. Um, and, and also at the same time would, would think about those things and explain to me like, you know, this product is doing this right and, and this is not the right way. And, and so I think she has a really good um, ability to uh, uh, sort of evaluate the, the frontier of products, if that makes sense. And what have you learned from Scott? Oh, gosh, I'm always learning from Scott. Scott's like an oracle of information. So we like to joke that I have a really fast processor and no hard drive, and he has a really big hard drive and a slower processor. So we, we sometimes get to the same answers, but not on the same time scale. And I'm more impulsive. And so it, it works out. It actually is quite beautiful because he'll say, well, how, what was the logic path that you got? And I was like, I don't know. You know, I'll just come up with some wackadoodle reason for why I came up with something. And he'll come up with something that's like, well, I crunched all these numbers and I did this and that and other. And, you know, so it's, it's fascinating to see. And like, you also have an amazing amount of trivia in that brain of yours. So, I don't know. We're always learning from each other. That's great. I'd love to open it up to questions as well and make it interactive. So, um, if anyone has questions, I'd love for you to share maybe just a sentence on, yeah, your name, if you're working on anything, and a question. Um, yeah, thank you so much for giving this talk. I think it's not very traditional, the questions and answers that have been talked about, and I think it's really interesting. Um, yeah. I know Corey asked you about the common mistakes that early stage founders have. 
And I'm kind of wondering if you've seen any similarities between them or any habits or mental models that they have that have made the successful founders successful. Uh, ego is always going to be your number one enemy. And it gets in the way all the time. These founder disputes are just a game of ego, right? You know, it's not being able to put that aside for the better purpose, the higher purpose of the company. And I see this happen over and over again from, you know, uh, maybe taking secondaries too soon or, you know, always putting yourself before the company and your coworkers and the mission that you're on is, to me, it can work out sometimes, but in general, it's a path to failure. And that's the one commonality I see across all of them is no matter how much I try to sit down and tell them, like, this isn't about you, this isn't about you. <laughs> like, if you do this, this is going to be catastrophic for these reasons. Um, there's always this pesky little ego in the background that's like, you know, I, I need to take my thing, I need to do my thing, my thing, and not thinking about, like, how that impacts everyone else. And almost, I, I can't give you a real percentage, but I would say the percentage is pretty high that you're going to fail. So... You know, I, that's one of the things I would watch, which is, you know, a certain amount of ego is good because you need to feel confident, but you've also got to realize, is this real? Like, I'm, like, if you're angry at a coworker, is that real? You know, is it really going to matter five years from now, this thing you're fighting about? You know, you've got to be, like, really practical about this stuff. I, I, I think um, one of the things that really good CEOs know how to do is the company is supposed to try and the CEO specifically is supposed to try to make all the people they're working with successful. And that can take many different forms, right? It should mean that even if the company fails, we all came out of the company with more skills, with better better management, better ability to work with others, you know, whatever whatever it is. Um, and then by the same token then they encourage the employees to help make the company be successful, right? So there's kind of a circle there. Um, that I think if you don't, if you don't really focus on that, right, as a CEO, if you don't wake up every day and you, can, and you can't just think, well, my job is to make the company successful, right? Like it doesn't, you're skipping a step there, right? It's sort of my job is to make my employees successful and the employees will make the company successful and then the company will make the employees successful. And that, I just, um, I, I see a lot of people veer away from that and that's probably the beginning of the end usually. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Um, I'm curious about. I read an article that maybe like early on in the Zigbee journey, um, things split or something into like maybe two companies. Yeah. Like Zigbee and like top. Thing. Top fan. Top fan. Yep. And some of what you're talking about, I don't know if it has any relation. To that. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Founder dispute. I guess I was curious, if that relates, like, what, what's the story there? Well, I signed an NDA, so I can't get into the details, but I can tell you that only fans is worth however many billions of dollars, and that could have been us. But um, part of it was we were too soon. We started Zivity in, uh, uh, around the time MySpace was launched, and we thought there is this movement happening where there are people, this one-to-many fan model, where there are models who are trying to reach this audience, but they have no way to monetize it. But the only, the only person or people that are, that are basically capturing that value is MySpace and the advertisers. So we also really believe that subscription services hadn't really seen their time. So we were trying to build the HBO of the internet at the time, like a place where adults could be adults. And it was incredibly controversial. Uh, I remember it was incredibly difficult for us at first to raise money and how many people kind of laughed about it or the stigma behind it. Uh, it was quite possibly the hardest company, one of the hardest companies you could start because your payment processors won't work with you, your hosting providers eventually, WeWork wouldn't even let me have an office there. You know, like imagine you're starting a company but on hard, 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 hard mode and I'm super excited that OnlyFans exists because I'm like, at least it's validating to some degree, but it, it, it sucks, it hurts, because I get calls all the time, they're like, how did you screw up so badly? You know, and, but at the same time, I feel really good that Scott and I actually came up, so Scott and I came up with Zivity, and I think, you know, we invented 
I believe we invented, I could be wrong, but I believe we invented crowdfunding of sorts at the time. There was nobody else doing... Of that doing, sort of content. For, yeah, for nobody sure. else was doing yeah. anything like it. And then Kickstarter, Patreon, and all of those, those sites came later. And which goes to show you can have the right idea at the wrong time. You know, the iPhone didn't exist. And you can also have people issues in your company. That, we had both. That mm -hmm. So we had people issues system. and the right idea at the wrong time. So, you know, we couldn't have an app on the App Store. We couldn't uh, advertise. Uh, even today, like, if you wanted to start a company in this space, and this is one of the reasons why I don't invest in this space anymore is because I know what hurdles they're against. You can't advertise on Instagram. You can't even have your content on Instagram. So, like, Twitter is probably the last frontier of where you can advertise this content. And... Hopefully that answers your question, but yeah, it was a combination of a lot of things that went wrong there. Um, but I was the CEO, I own it. You know, that's one of the things where um, uh, you have to own all that stuff in the end. After we went through two previous CEOs. Correct, I inherited it, but, yeah. but I was the founder. On the controversial front, is there anything that you think is super controversial today that will be very normal tomorrow? Um, Going back to AI and Zivity, um, I think there's a marriage there. Uh, I think there's going to be robots and chat bots that are going to take the place of even the people on OnlyFans, and that's gonna be very disruptive. Because when you can talk to somebody or something and it's indistinguishable from reality, and maybe even better, you might prefer that because you don't think there's a human being being harmed or you don't the ethics of it might feel better. And so I think that's going to be a really interesting space that will take off. And maybe investors will finally look at the space with some legitimacy and think, you know, there could be exits that might be investable. But for the most part, it's not. There's really no one to acquire your company. It's, it's not going to go anywhere. There's a question over There's two questions. Uh, um, you don't manage Christian. I started a company called Seltzer. Um, you mentioned a lot about uh, trying to like persuade people to see things like a certain way. I think your example is like trying to persuade people to like give up their ego a little bit. Have you found like a specific way to do that that's effective? Lately, I'm trying something new. So the answer is it's always a process because if, have you ever seen like a magic trick and you look at it and it takes your breath away and you gasp and they're like, how did you do it? And they might even tell you, but three minutes later, it's like it didn't happen. Um, you can like sit there and try to get it through to people and it and sometimes it's just it's a really it's a personal journey for everybody but right now i'm recommending rick rubin's book um the creative act a way of being i think is what it's called and it's it really helps especially to understand um, an artist mind but to understand potentially where an idea comes from and it challenges the assumption of the ego that we are somehow responsible for all the ideas that we have. But really it's a culmination of experiences of people you've encountered during the day or that week or where you were born or what media you consume, et cetera. And it's much more complicated than that. And so when you start realizing like, oh, I do have a purpose, I am meant to do this, but I am not the ingredient. I am not, a lot of people have this, I gotta be Steve Jobs, you know? sort of thing that that was that was a hot thing for a while too everybody was Steve Jobs but not everybody can be Steve Jobs and so I think I think you have to have some level of humbleness um, in order to be successful so that's the book right now I'm recommending I carry around I wish I brought some I would have given them to you guys but I usually carry around a stack of them um, if anybody wants one I could probably get you one but um, I think that's probably the, the simplest most beautiful if you don't know who Rick Rubin is he made like some of the most renowned songs. Def Jam, but, right? Yeah, well, was he Def Jam? I don't know. But he, a lot of the songs that he, he's responsible for, he didn't write any of the music. He doesn't know how to read music. He doesn't know how to perform music, and he's never played an instrument. So how, is, how did he produce some of the most impactful music in the world was because he's an, edit an editor. He can hear change. And I would argue that investing in being an entrepreneur is being able to see change. And you're an artist. All of you, if you're, if you're an entrepreneur, you are an artist. So definitely read that book. Hey, how's it going? Um, uh, you, you mentioned Travis at Uber, how he was sort of hyper-aggressive in scaling out operations. It, it kind of worked until it went a bit overboard. I know it's a pretty common mindset <coughs> for a lot of the top founders. Do you think there's a, some sort of balance to strike there? Yes. I mean, 
the entrepreneur should match the problem, right? Like, I've seen, like, let's take Brendan Eich, for example, who started Brave. So that's, a, that's an investment I've done. And Brendan is, is, he doesn't make eye contact. He looks at his feet. He's very quiet. He's the opposite of Travis. He doesn't take up a lot of room in, in a room. And as a matter of fact, the first uh, offsite that I did with their company, all of the employees were on laptops talking to each other on Slack, and no one was saying a thing. Okay, but why does that work? So you got to ask yourself, why does Brendan Ike in that particular situation work, and why would Travis be a bull in a bull shop, or China shop, not a bull in a bull shop, bull in a China <laughs> shop? Yeah. Well, the reason why it works is because he's managing engineers, and these engineers are really attracted to him in specific because he is the creator of JavaScript. And he has this gravitas as an engineer that people want to learn from him. And so he really shines when he writes. And so one of the things I look for is, is the skill of the entrepreneur matched with the problem and the culture they're trying to create? Because they're all, they all come in hand. So like, yes, fighting a taxi medallion system takes a warrior, but maybe starting some SaaS software doesn't. You know? And so SaaS software, and, and interestingly, there is a type of entrepreneur that I love which is people who are uniquely excited about the most boring thing in the world. So I will invest in them all day long because there's, there's an inherent moat in it. Like the, if the you, boredom moat. It's the boredom moat. It's like basically this person will come in front of you and they'll start talking about notaries, right? So like Pat Kinzel, I invested in Notarize, and he came in and I had never met anyone in my life who was more excited about revolutionizing the notary system. You know, who gets excited? Do you get excited about notaries? Is there a single person in here who's just like, notaries? Yeah, exactly. So Pat has no competition. And that's why I invested in him. And I think, one, he's brilliant. But two, you know, that there's a certain special, like there's Sheertex, the founder of Sheertex, who created indestructible pantyhose. She came in with all of these, these fabric things and started cutting them with scissors, and they wouldn't cut, and then starts telling me about how they were manufactured, but the level of detail she went into just shows that she went through the rabbit hole pretty darn deep. And, you know, I was just like, wow, no one's gonna compete with you, not for a while. You know, so so there is there is something to each personality and it really just depends on what you're working on. Like if you're gonna work on a boring, boring company that you find very sexy and exciting just for you, that's great. Like don't let anybody tell you that it's boring or you're not on the right track. Like if you really think that what you're doing is gonna disrupt some spreadsheet somewhere, because there's still so, you'd be surprised at how many businesses are still spreadsheet businesses that can still be disrupted. And they may not seem exciting, but they could revolutionize and change the world for how businesses are run, et cetera. Do you have anything to add? No. <laughs> oh. Do you wanna call on people, or you want Up me to, to call? <laughs> Yeah, uh, thank you guys so much. Um, I'm curious about how you address the defensibility question. I mean, it tied back to like the answer you just gave, like people focused on really, I mean, things that other people find boring and do them really well. But, you know, like with generative AI now, you know, it become much easier to build a product, but then how do you defend it effectively? Uh, even if you have a lot of users, other companies have great channels and you can, you know. But you still, them. you still, and until the foreseeable future, a human being still has to come up with the idea and tell the AI about the idea and then run the process of running a business. The AI can't yet hire everybody for you and run the business. Now that may happen. Like I don't know if you guys have played with AutoGPT, but that's crazy. Like I set up this goal where I was like, start a fashion brand for Gen Z, uh, come back to me in 100 decisions later. And it was asking for credit cards to spin up manufacturing places and like all sorts of stuff. And I was like, this is insane. And it was doing it probably right. I was like looking at this and I was like, but I think for a while it's still going to take a human to figure out what that uniquely boring thing is. And maybe AI augments them and makes them faster at execution. But I don't think that it increases competition necessarily because it's still a boring idea at the end of the day. Like people, people tend to go towards the flashy fun stuff. Like for example, there was a big wave where NFTs were, you know, like every startup that came to me was NFT this, NFT that. Before that was AR, then it's VR. There's these waves that happen right now. It's AI, but I don't think this wave is like a passing fad. It's early fad. in this wave, for sure. Yeah, yeah, I don't think it's a passing fad this time. Um, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. Um, can I ask one more? What do you think about hardware? 
Um, we've just had really, <laughs> we've had really bad luck investing I wish out, I was good outside of software. Um, there's just, I mean, software is a magical business, right? Like fixed cost and low marginal costs. And um, uh, every time we try to do something outside of, outside of software, it invariably is not one, let's just say it's, it is not one of our top, you know, uh, SpaceX outcomes. is probably the only hardware company we've yeah, done Yeah, so well. SpaceX, I guess, is the, is the outlier because that's obviously yeah. <laughs> pretty heavy on the hardware. And then there's but. a few others, but like for the most part, it's a lot of entrepreneurs and it's beautiful because if you think about all of these devices, like this thing that's sitting in front of me, some person had to dream up this thing and get it made and bring it here and we had to find it in the distribution. I don't know how you found this thing, but you found it. And that's the hardest part about hardware is you don't, pretty much every hardware entrepreneur I've met underestimates how much money they're going to need. And they raise too little and then what happens is they can't, they come back to the well and nobody will give them any more money. It happens over and over and over again because they didn't figure out, or there's just things outside of their control like, like maybe they're manufacturing in China and China goes on New Year. Um, or there's global macro conditions, wars. You know, all of these things make it much more difficult to manufacture hardware. And so there are investors who are very good at it and hats off to them, but it's not us. Why SpaceX? Why SpaceX? <laughs> uh, okay, so he used to work at PayPal um, and he worked with a guy named Luke Nosek, who was his co-founder. Uh, they're co-creators of PayPal. Um, co-creators of one specific idea at PayPal and I was never an employee. But okay, he anyway. was on the board and it was the first check-in, but anyway, he's very humble. Um, this friend of ours, Luke Nosek, uh, recommended that we do the investment. And I, so I think we really have to give him credit. And there's also a gentleman named Barney Pell, who was a NASA, is, was a NASA engineer. He worked at NASA for a long time. And so right. he sat us down and walked us through how this would work. And then there was sort of a legacy with Elon, you know, that you knew Elon, I didn't know Elon. Um, so a working relationship there that, that happened in the past. And I think it was Luke's passion. You know, he pretty much, if you ever meet Luke, he was pretty much on his knees screaming like, you have to do this, I'm putting my whole life. When someone comes to you with that level of conviction, because he was just like, I'm, I may never do another deal in my life. Like, I'm only gonna do this one. And sure enough, like when he was at Founders Fund, I think he didn't do another deal, or if he did, it was like one. And then he and went he off and started raising SPVs that did nothing but invest in SpaceX. Hundreds of millions of dollars just to invest in SpaceX. Yeah. And, and so when we invested, they were still blowing up on the launch pad. I mean, it was, it was crazy. Um, I actually thought it was a huge mistake potentially, <laughs> but, but it I think it does, fine. I think it does point out uh, one thing that we do take pretty seriously, which is it, it is a people business. Um, and uh, so you, you develop relationships and you should take it seriously if, if one of the people that you have a relationship with is telling you to invest in the company, starting a company, joining a company, right? Like those are all signals um, that maybe cause you to override your normal intuitions. Well, the other thing is privatization of space travel and stuff like that was very interesting to us because of our political background. So that also plays into Uber interestingly because we wanted, we wanted the medallion system to go away. But we also think that Space exploration and space industry shouldn't just be a NASA endeavor. You know, like if you want to open up this to the world, you have to have private companies doing this type of work. Short follow up. I've seen the other companies, I think they're bullshit. Who's really competing with SpaceX right now? Because I've seen them. <laughs> Hopefully, no one. No, yeah. I, I work for them. Uh, but yeah. I don't, I don't, honestly, I don't see relativity. I see their 30 grain when they're talking about how they're going to beat that. They haven't even reached orbit yet. They're not doing anything. I don't see these other companies competing. Do you think anyone's beating SpaceX? No. I mean, I'm biased, but no. Um, <laughs> I do think that there's a lot of grift in this space. Yeah. And it's, it's really sad to me, actually, because people are so excited about space and space technology that if they don't have a background um, in that form of engineering, they can be easily snowed into some of these companies. So I've been to a few 
uh, events where there was nothing there in a lot of companies, but people were like, woo, I want to get involved in the next SpaceX, right? Yeah. But there is no next SpaceX, I don't think, and not for the time being. Um, it takes a very brave person who's willing to put everything on the line. It's incredibly capital intensive. You know, this is why there's Jeff Bezos and, and Elon, you know, and I don't even know what Jeff Bezos' stuff is doing, um, but it's not working. It's not working. <laughs> yes. So uh, pretty long on Elon, and, and you know maybe there'll be others that emerge over time, but, but there's no denying that he's had a huge impact in, in the space. What was Elon like in the X.com PayPal days? So, so actually, I only really knew Elon through other people, if that makes, if that makes sense. Like I, I, uh, uh, he was, for a while, he was, our comp he was, our comp he was running our competitor. Um, and then he was the CEO after the merger, and then he was a CEO that was pushed out. Like I sort of just knew him indirectly, basically. I only know him at weddings. So I see him at weddings and it's like, oh, hi, and that's it. But, yeah. Appreciate it. Uh, so you mentioned about some app, a lot of apps in the US that have been doing applications where uh, the thing was eventually sticky without 100, 100 million users. So like in hindsight, do you, how, how do you initially look at it in terms of obviously knowing that this, if this was sticky, that's when it would really have value, but then when you look back at it, oh, this was obvious, this was not really sticky. So is there, is there a pattern that you do? I mean, because we're on the frontier of things, sometimes you can mistake growth for product market fit. And we've done it many times. I, I can probably name five or six companies that we've invested in that had incredible growth. Part of it is, as VCs, you know incredible growth for at least their period of time was very difficult to achieve. Um, now there's all sorts of gamification. There's all sorts of things that people can do uh, to misrepresent numbers and all sorts of things like that. But you know, I think everything's a learning process. When I look back, it, it sometimes it's glaringly obvious what we missed. Um, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's, you know, how could you predict that, you know, some other technology would appear and completely disrupt or some news event would happen or, you, you know, you can't predict any of those things. That people are fickle, especially when it comes to consumer products. You know, when people think that no one will move from Google, you know, it, it will happen. It's just not going to be on the time scale you imagine, but it's going to happen. And you know, that's why you always have to be ready to be disrupted, to be displaced, for a competitor to come along and, and eat you alive, right? But as, as much of a moat that you can make and as defensible as you can make yourself to last as long as you can is really the answer. And, and I think one of the ways to have that not happen is um, it comes back to the CEO, if they really want to make their consumer successful in some real way, right? Um, that it's not just numbers, that there's people on the other mm -hmm. ends of those, those products. And what is, how are we making that person more successful in their life through our product, right? Um, sometimes it's not what you imagine or what you want. Like yeah. cus customers will tell you what you're building. That, that, that too, and, and really listening to the customers as well. Oh, I love all these questions. How about back there? Yeah, hi, my name is Nico. I'm a founder of Reinventing How the World Is Laundry. So I definitely get what you mean about being uh, fascinated with something that everybody else finds boring. Um, <laughs> awesome. My, my question is, what have you seen the biggest factors or the biggest things that have to go right for a company to go from $1 million to $100 million in revenue and then from $100 million to a billion? This is going to be your question. You're the growth person. Gosh. I mean, um, you know, that, that $1 million to $100 million is is what's really hard. I mean, even... Even one to five is is is, is really hard. You know, there's, um, uh, and I think it's one of the most mysterious things. Um, uh, Why don't you talk about maybe Postmates for like use a use a case? Yeah, I mean, it's, it kind of gets back to all these things, right? Like you you have to build a really good company, and I'm just talking about internally as a company, and let's just ignore what market you're in, right? Like a culture and people at the company and management and all that stuff has to be working. Um, and then you have to be, you know, building something that adds real value to consumers and you have to be responsive to your market. Um, and I think it's just, it, beco it becomes a lot about execution, I guess, at that point, right? If you've, you've sort of proven that, okay, there is a market, people will exchange money for this, 
now how do we how do we grow this um, that I, I, th I think just becomes a lot about execution and that execution is sort of what's mysterious and magical about any particular company uh, uh, and and the entrepreneurs in that in that company is will will they be able to will they be able to do that um, and what's interesting is sort of part of what you're betting on even at the seed stage before the company even has a million dollars in revenue is you're kind of trying to see into the future as to is this is this entrepreneur going to be capable of making those next steps right like you're not investing in a company to have a million dollars in revenue like that's that's not a end game that any of us are really interested in right so um so you're trying to see into the future like can this person be a leader you know, I, I will say that the thing that I am sort of most impressed with um, uh, in all the work that I've done is the CEOs that can be there for the long haul, right? And to watch those CEOs grow from a person who literally is just pitching you on some idea and they have no product and no team and no, no anything. And to, and to see those people over time like grow into the role of CEO um, you know, I think some people can do it and, and, and some people can't. And how does that happen? I mean, I, I have to believe that on, honestly, the entrepreneurs that are able to do it probably have some help from God. It's, it's just a hard it's thing. It's so hard. And yeah. As, as a follow-up, um, how have you seen entrepreneurs, and especially first-time founders that don't have a track record to back on very much fundraising specifically, show investors like yourself that we do have what it takes to scale up? Well, the biggest thing is we, we invest in a lot of founders that don't have a track record. That's actually because of the stage that we're in. Uh, we are early stage seed investors and sometimes uh, you know, the, the products that we invest in do not have product market fit and they're very raw. Um, so what we're looking for is you to be able to say this is a market size opportunity of this size, I believe, and this is my approach. This is my battle plan of how I'm going to go take it over. And this is what's unique about this approach. One of the things that we have seen that you can kind of count on is thousands of companies. And because for all the companies we've said yes to, there's a bunch of them that we've said no to. And it is like going to a university because you learn from the pitch decks, you learn. And so we're going to ask you like, okay, we've seen these six other companies. You know, how is your approach going to be differentiated and how, how, where do you get that insight? How do you know what you know that no one else seems to know? You know, Peter's famous for asking that question. Tell me something you know that nobody else knows, but that's the secret to what's gonna make you successful is you have kind of like a KFC secret recipe that is proprietary to you that no one else has figured out and you're gonna leverage that. And it could be brand, it could be speed, it could be software improvements, it could be efficiency, it could be a lot of different things. But, you know, I, I'll just stop there, but yeah. Ooh, oh my gosh, questions. wow, we'll go here. One thing that I think is really important for, especially earlier stage founders in this room to see is just how much rejection is a part of the process of fundraising. Yes. So you've talked a lot about the biggest investments you've made. Can you talk a bit about the investments that you passed on that ended up being very successful and why you passed on them? Everyone loves the anti-portfolio stories. Um, <laughs> They're very moralizing. It's like an early stage yeah. that gets rejected all day. The good news is there's very few that I wanted to invest in that I did what not. I, I, I might have wanted to invest in what not. The problem is that when you become an investor, you can either decide to invest in competitors or not. And each individual investor has their own beliefs about that and our beliefs are we don't invest in competitors but there's an argument to be made that if you went and invested in uber lyft and all of the competitors you would have been fine or all of the food delivery apps. we didn't we didn't invest in instacart because we were already in postmates for example and you see how the companies evolved over time they're really very mildly competitors at this point but early on we didn't know how much grocery delivery would be part of the postmates business and so we didn't want to be competitive with it so there's a great yeah. anti-portfolio so company for, there, for every one of our companies that's a duopoly or things like that, there was obviously an opportunity we could have done both, potentially, and we didn't. And so a lot of those are anti-portfolio. Um, 
Udemy was a company that I was excited about that we didn't do. Um, because I wasn't excited. He wasn't excited. And, but this is when we were like honing our ability to work together and trying to figure out like who vetoes or how do we veto or you know, if you have a strong opinion. But eventually we worked that out. Um, I guess, I don't know if you, rec if you regret Yammer. Uh, I guess. Yeah, I blocked Yammer. Yeah, um, because at the time it was a, it was it was a different company. Yeah. It was a genealogy business and I was against it. And uh, then it turned into Yammer, which goes to show like, okay, like you can't really be dogmatic about it. It was, it was David Sachs, we should have done it in yeah. the story. Yeah, um, that's correct. And I think there's things like that. Uh, what other ones? I mean, I um, there's some that where we, we regretted it, but then we were saved. So you you like you're like oh I really wish I was in uh, we Fab. We didn't invest in Fab, and Fab. it went like this, and then it went, and it went <laughs> yeah. like that. Yeah. And then you're like oh great. <laughs> uh, a little bit of an offbeat question, but how did you get into spirituality, and uh, has this changed anything about like? Your approach to company building, or angel investing at all, or? I don't really build companies anymore, but I am building a venture firm. So I guess it is a company technically, but uh, it has really changed my idea of what I should be investing in and how I do it. So I am much more in tune with: is what you're building fundamentally going to matter? And is it going to endure and is it really going to change the world in a way that alleviates suffering in some way? So I think the key, the real key to happiness, if I were to give you the key to happiness, is to get rid of your own suffering and to get rid of others. And what is suffering? Like suffering could be doubt, it could be fear. Fear is probably the number one thing. Um, it could be imposter syndrome, it could be you know, a childhood story you tell yourself. It could be an identity that you're tied up with that is keeping you out of doing something. Suffering comes in so many different flavors. But I think spirituality taught me about that and how it came about, uh, it was unexpected. I considered myself an atheist and I had an experience, I don't know how else to describe it, that made me question free will. And you know, there's only so many times you start to see patterns, and I know human beings like to find patterns, that you start to be like, okay, maybe there's something, it's like a glitch in the matrix type of thing. I don't know how else to just explain it, but you're just like, there's something special going on here, and I can't quite put my finger on it. But I'm leaning more towards the simulation-like side of things than ever before. And, you know, but who knows? We'll, 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 we'll all get to find out. We'll be on the same boat together. Uh, hi. There. Yeah, okay. Hi, I'm David. And then you next. Oh, okay. Right? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. Hi, I'm David, uh, and I have a company called Honeydew. We do virtual care for chronic dermatology conditions. And my question is: So you made a comment earlier that software is like your sweet spot, um, and then but then we're talking about like Uber and Postmates. And but like all those are really software companies, software companies, right? They just interact with the world in some particular hard way. But they have human services. Correct, but at the end of the day, it's powered by software. It's a it's a software company, right? You take the software out of the company, it's just it's not it's nothing, yep. right? And maybe some people would argue that SpaceX is a software company in some weird way as well. But um, uh, I think there's sort of the what is the what is the what is the essence of what the company is building. Um, uh, maybe that's not even the right. If there's a if there's a core economic value to the software that they're building, that has a big impact on the outcome of the business, you that's what you want to be riding with. Right? You want to be riding with sort of entities that build software for for good outcomes. A lot right? of the problems they had to solve were like, how do we get a sandwich from point A to point B, and can they make a stop on the way? And and is it safe for them to go this route? And how many, you know, you think about that, none of that existed. And Uber and Postmates and DoorDash and Instacart really paved the way for this virtual augmented reality sort of situation where you're watching a car come to you with your sandwich is actually a very difficult problem. It isn't, it's well understood now, but in the, at the time it was not. And so that very much makes it a software and technology company. Yeah, that answers my question. That was gonna ask like, yeah, I think as long as there's a high software quotient, 
you know, I, I, I think we, we're still we're interested, you know. On open source? open source? Yeah, open well, the company he founded, um, a lot of what that product was was built off open source software. So, you know, I think the internet and a lot of the technologies that we rely on depend on open source products like Linux. The, the fundamentals of how the internet works wouldn't work without DNS or, you know, TCP IP and various projects that are open source. So I think, like, I'm a big fan because I think otherwise it would be sort of the tragedy of the commons. I mean, it kind of is already. Like DNS is probably one of the, the most valuable services on the internet and it's underfunded and there's a few companies in the space, but like, you know, if, if they weren't doing a good job, you wouldn't be able to resolve any host sites and the internet would just be down, you know? So, um, you know, are you talking about a company that has an open source component to it? Uh, what? I mean, I think there's a, there's a model now that a lot of people are using, which is you build open source, you're committed to an open source project, and then you have some cloud, you know, version or some cloud utility that is based on that open source project, and then you monetize the, 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 the cloud opportunity, right? Um, and I think people have been very successful with that. Um, and I think people will continue to be successful with that. And it also has a great outcome for, for, for everyone, right? Like the fact that people have the option uh, to, to use it open source. Uh, back blue shirt. Hi, my name is Hoffman. I'm working on a content localization startup. And I have two questions. One is, um, as someone self-educated, what, what sort of insights do you have on how to learn? And how do you think that applies to, um, I guess, like being a founder and learning beyond just like consuming knowledge through pure experience. And then secondly, in your Substack book, you talk about um, how you Thanks have for reading that. Yeah. I appreciate that. Uh, you talk about how you have these like secret future ambitions, uh, long-term ambitions that you're working towards. And if you told anybody, you thought, you, like, they'd think you're crazy. What are some of those uh, ideas? <laughs> oh, dear. Um, I wasn't expecting anyone to read that. It's funny because you write things, and, and you put them out there, and then people read them, and you're like, whoa, somebody read it. It's crazy. Uh, what was the first question? And I'll get to the second one. Um, so as someone self-educated. Self-educated tools. OK. Yeah. Um, everybody learns differently. And so I'm a visual thinker and a visual learner. And so I do best when I'm shadowing somebody or I watch a video or I experience something. You know, Other people are better at consuming novels at an astonishing rate. Some people um, run on their treadmill and listen to audiobooks. I am not one of those people. But I think it's more about a mentality, which is every day you're going to make it a goal or a purpose to learn something more that not only makes yourself better, but like, can you, can you make the human experience better because of it? Like, I see people that want to learn guitar, for example, but if you're not playing songs for people, why learn? You know, it's one of those things where it could be satisfying. You could have this skill under your belt, but like, I would argue that it's a skill that was meant to be enjoyed and to serenade people with, and, and you could whip it out and make the world a better place. And so I think if you could think about that and think about like, I'm going to be a CEO, I want to be a really good manager, so why don't I start consuming all the management books I can possibly get my hands on, or I'm gonna go meet my heroes and talk to them and ask them questions. And, but really it's just insatiable curiosity, and how you do it is kind of personalized to you. Oh, I'm going to ask his, answer his question later. Sorry, I, I didn't forget it. Go ahead. <laughs> on, on that notion, you, you've said that you like, want to get a little bit better every day. And that um, on, on the other hand, there's this notion that companies should be dramatically different and dramatically better than existing solutions to like the structure market. So do you think that incrementalism also applies to like starting a startup? Or is this more like once you've settled on a dramatically better idea, you should that's it. Yes, you just stated the answer to the question. There you go. Yeah, so you, you, you plot a point that's out here, and then once you're there, well, now you're incrementally sailing a ship, right? So you don't start your ship in the same place as every other ship. You go put your ship somewhere, and then now you're incrementally sailing your ship, right? 
talk to the customers over and over again, roll out a feature, see what they do with it. You know, that, that all becomes, I think, very, very incremental. And I think what's very difficult then is when you see some of the really successful companies over time, they can kind of do those, that, those two steps repeatedly, right? They're like, throw a boat out here, that is now incremental here, now toss a rowboat out there, that boat starts sailing this direction, right? It's like, you know, iPod and iPhone and, you know, what, like, maybe that's not the best example, but you get the, you get the idea. I'm going to go back to his question. I really don't know how to answer that question. It's such a good one, but uh, my in-game goal is to be an artist, and I want to make art that, that matters. And I think in order to make art that matters, you have to not care about the outcome of that art or whether it's financially viable. So some of the greatest artists that you know that made an impact in the world, like if you look at Banksy, one could argue that it's obviously financially viable at this point. But you, know, um, you have to put it out there without anyone really caring. And in order to do that, you have to have sort of a level of stability or just you give no Fs and you just go to it. And so I have a lot of plans. Um, that I would prefer to keep to myself because I would rather surprise the world and it's not clear that I'll, I'll, I'll seek attribution for these things or not. Um, but the first thing I'm doing is, is working on a book um, and then we'll start there. Hi. Uh, Hello. You, yes, you. My name is Adam. Uh, nice. I like your sweatshirt. That's cool. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, my co-founder and I are working on a voice conversation partner for reaching professional fluency in English. And regarding the co-founder co-founder relationship, I'm curious if you have come across any habits that you can engage in together as co-founders to maintain and, and strengthen and improve your relationship. I, I have an obvious one. Oh, go so for it. so when we started Ironport, my co-founder and I, and he was the CEO, um, we shared an office, right? And I know offices are like, you know, do people still use offices anymore? But but I think that was really, really valuable for us, right? Because at any point during the day, you know, you just speak to the other person, ask a question, check in, right? What do you think about this? Um, it really kept us, you know, we weren't going to be uh, veer very far apart when we're sitting right next to each other, you know, every day, right? Um, so there's probably versions of that that you can try to achieve in other ways. But I think that's, Conceptually, that's that's what you're going for, right? Like this is a person that you're sharing an office with. This isn't a person that you sort of toss into another part of the business and sort of, you know, why don't you both just sort of run separately and we'll see what happens at the end, right? Like that, you, you should be running. You should be running together. It's the it's the rest of the company that's more spread out. Like the, if it's two or three or however many of you, like you you need to be close. Yeah, this may sound non-intuitive, but eat together. You know, this, this is the things that shocked me about um, the co-founders of HQ Trivia was when they were having problems, I asked them, when's the last time you guys have had a dinner together? And it was like five years ago is what they told me. And I was like, wait, you guys don't break bread? You don't like have a meal together? And they were like, no, we hate each other. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's how you get there, right? Is you stop seeing each other as human beings. You stop seeing each other as that person that you were, you, you love this idea. It's just like any wedding, marriage, whatever that went wrong, you know? And you like the stars in your eyes are gone and the love is lost. You know, that's when you know you need therapy. And that, that's actually, they do make founder therapy and it works. And so I would recommend you find a coach. There are CEO coaches and founder coaches. And they're remarkably good if you find a good one. And they, they it's the same thing as marriage counseling. They sit you down and they're like, okay, you know, what's going on, and they're uniquely qualified to navigate the types of situations that you're in. And so I think it's important not to feel like, like you know how to solve everything. You know, uh, the other thing is to reach out to other founders and say, how would you solve this problem that we're having? Like, do you have any ideas? And then obviously to partner with someone who's interested in that kind of growth, you know, and creating a, a dynamic that's positive for you both. Green shirt with a D. I was wondering how you feel about remote teams, uh, for remote teams, especially when they're international. Uh, there's a lot of time in terms of the small products are great for the long time, and it's nice for well as well. I don't know that I, I have a hard opinion. Some VCs have, <coughs> have a 
you know, like if you look at Founders Fund, they've definitely more gone, they've gone more to the, the you've got to be in the office and everybody has to be there. Um, but the pandemic definitely taught us that remote can work. Uh, I think that there are some productivity hits that people are starting to see, and so they're like, come back to the office. <coughs> right now, it sort of remains to be seen. We're still in the early days of trying to figure out, like we've got this great big A-B test going on right now with the workforce of what will work. So I don't, I don't think I can say with any certainty. Some people are particularly good at managing remote teams, and some are not. And some feel like they can extract more value from the situation if they're right in front of you, and they can break bread with you and and do all of those human elements that we're, we're missing on Zoom. And so it really just depends on what kind of leader you are. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. Um, it's really about results at the end of the day. Right? One, I, I read something recently that really resonated with me, which was even if the remote employee model results in plenty of productivity and the company is successful, is the company creating success for the employees? Right, because they're just all out in these silos they're not interacting with each other. They're not building a lot of skills that they might have built if they were in an office together, right? So even if the outcome of the company is the same, do those people then go out into the world and, and have the same follow-on outcomes? And I, I tend to think maybe the follow-on outcomes will be better for, for companies that had offices. Just if I may ask a follow-up, it's, it's kind of the same thing. In particular, like, um I'm having a hard time, and I just really just want to advise on this. I'm having a hard time in terms of like having these uh, other like people I'm trying to bring on. Like I really know them from past experience. They're developers in India, and they, they work together in an office space, co-working space, building the product. But I'm here in the US, and the product is, is the market is here, and I'm working with other people who launch the product here. Uh, so it's kind of like two spaces. So I have to switch my time, but then the, 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 this is really smart talent. I can't just like let go. So any advice on that? Yeah, managing people in different time zones is tough. Uh, I used to run customer service for uh, Ironport uh, worldwide, and we had to we had 24/7 support, and so I had to. I, we did stuff in India, we did stuff all over the place, and I think, you know, um, I mean, it's just really a personal preference. If it's not working for you, then it's not working for you. But if they're really, really talented and they're, you know, extraordinary engineers and they're producing really good work that you can't find anyplace else, then you've got to adapt yourself to them. Right, you might have to keep a different schedule, and because if you can't find better talent than that, then you know it's kind of like it's the burden hand. You know, you got to make it work. I want to be mindful of y'all's date night, but we, we can keep going. No, that's yeah. fine. I think we're good. We're fine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there. Um, I just wanted to go even like one level deeper on that. I'm curious. I kind of haven't heard anybody, which is maybe surprising given the pandemic, have a like, really good strategic or tactical thoughts for how to do remote um, teams at the like founder stage, but I'm curious if there's like playbooks and on the level of depth I mean is like maybe somebody uses some like tech in particular or like eats lunch together or you know some things like that. I think the person that we know that's most successful with remote teams is Matt Mullenweg at WordPress. Yeah. So he was remote before it was cool. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So he had an office, but no one ever came to it. I think Git, um, GitHub was like GitHub that was too. Like that too. Yeah. There's a few really huge success stories, right? And um, yeah, so they, they, there's, there's a few. There's, it's, they're, they're definitely, uh, it's not common. Um, but I think there's a certain type of mentality, a certain type of structure, a certain type of everything you have to have in place. And I, if I were to look at a playbook, I would look at how WordPress was built. Because I think... I've never seen people more excited to work for a company that they never go to. So, I mean, it's a, and, and part of it is like the technology that they had, like when you went into the office, you saw little pictures on a, on a thing that showed you who was there and they were kind of low jacked moving around the office. And there's like lots of really interesting things and frameworks that they put into place long before Slack, long before any of that, that really resonated with them. And some people, um, I was just reading a story the other day about TSMC, the computer chip manufacturing company Taiwan. in Taiwan. Yep. During the pandemic, they used AR. And I, I was surprised. It was one of the best use cases of AR I've ever seen, and they're not going back. So they announced that they, the scientists won't be returning to the office, and they're going to do everything. Part of it is for national security reasons. Um, it's better if they, we don't know where they're at in the world. But the other is they found out they could collaborate perfectly fine on minuscule little wafer products using AR. So I think, I think you know, there's, there's great examples to look to 
if you're thinking about doing it. In the back. Um, Hi again. <laughs> uh, specifically in the realm of consumer tech, I guess like a lot of startups nowadays, like they're so very like stale weightless, like you put your email on there and don't hear anything back for a few months. Like as an investor, what is your idealistic like startup creating a pre product hype around what they're doing? I mean, I, th I think we probably don't attach much weight to that at all, actually, um, because kind of getting back to like, does the product ultimately deliver real value? You know, what is the retention of the product, right? Like without that, it can just, something can appear and be, you know, have a lot of downloads for one day because you're, you know, inviting a lot of people on a wait list, but that ultimately won't result in anything. So. Uh, you know, I think hype is not a, a long-term uh, value proposition. Scott mentioned that you were on the forefront of consumer apps, like back in the days of the early iPhone. I'm curious what uh, you see as the frontier of consumer apps now. I am really still excited about AR. And I'm looking forward to Apple's announcement in June. And I think that, you know, I was in, we were an early investor in, in Pokemon Go Niantic. And interestingly, they are the leading AR company in the space, but nobody uses AR. Uh, you can look at the Pokemon in the real world, but everyone shuts it off. So um, are they an AR company? I mean, I guess because you're tricking your mind that you're walking around and there's these invisible creatures in that sense it kind of is. But I'm really excited about uh, First, the camera being the lens to the invisible world, and then a wearable. Now, battery technology is not uh, where I would like it, but um, or where we need it to be. And then, of course, fashion is always an issue of whether or not people are going to think the glasses are cool, or cool enough or not. But I think the app ecosystem on that, we have not seen the killer app for that yet. It came out with tape measures. You know, there's been some like attempts at some stuff, but it's really going to take rethinking the world and the and interfaces. Like the UI for that world is incredibly different. Like the world that I see, that I envision, is one that uh, if I want to see how to operate this thing, I should be able to put on my wearable or shine my phone at it, and the manual comes up with step-by-step -step instructions of what to do, and it should be seamless for every device in the world. You know, there there are so many opportunities like this that don't exist, and so. I'm incredibly excited about that. And then, of course, AI. Any, any sort of, uh, like a lot of these art editing apps, you know, mid-journey, all that sort of stuff is just really fascinating to me. Did I answer your question? Yeah, shifting from consumer, uh, I'm curious about your, <clears throat> your FinTech portfolios, the ones that, don't, uh, that aren't consumer focused, and any characteristics of success you've seen in them. Do we do a lot of fintech? Mm, Non-consumer fintech? <laughs> yeah. Can you give me an example? Uh, well, I know there's like Rex, which is corporate. Uh, a firm? Okay, okay. Oh, the, okay. Well, a firm is, is consumer. That's consumer. Um, we didn't do Rex. I mean, I think, I mean, I'll just take a firm as, a, as an example, even though there's a heavy consumer component, but I would say actually, generically speaking, it is uh, the, the engine of their product is a B2B engine, right? So they go out, they find, um, you know, e-tailers that want to sell products that potentially have a ticket size that the consumer looking at the product may or may not want to spend right then. And they say, oh, we'll break it up into this many payments. And, and so, and then, and then the consumers are sort of the, the, the second, the, the second user, right? The first user is the, the, the business. Um, so I, uh, you know, I guess what's important about that is you need to really understand what problem you're solving for the business, right? Um, and uh, if you do a really good job at that, then there's probably an opportunity. I mean, I would say generically speaking that enterprise software is really, there's something nice about that business that's a little different than consumer software, which is that you can really go talk to consumers potential customers rather, um, and you can really learn about their needs and you can really try to figure out what to build 
in a way that maybe a consumer product for focus groups like would never really get you there. It requires a little bit more just sort of intuition to create a, a consumer a consumer product. But I think in the enterprise, I mean, you can go interview you know a hundred potential customers, right, in depth, right, um, and and potentially you could build your whole initial five million dollars of revenue off of those hundred customers, right. So there's something special about um, building B two B software um, that uh, I think. Honestly, if I were just randomly to make a recommendation to any entrepreneur, I'd just be like, go into B2B software, interview 100 customers, you'll figure it out. Right? That, 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 was, that was sort of my generic advice to, to any you know, would-be entrepreneur. Richard. Building off of what you just said, um, when you are like, looking into B2B and talking to 100 customers, you figure it out. How do you judge if an idea is good? Well, will they pay you? Uh, I think is important, right? Sometimes you can talk to a customer and they'll say, oh, well, we'd like this and we'd like that. Oh, okay, great. You know, how much per year are you, are you, are you going to pay, right? Um, uh, and then I think there's this weird intersection, which is the intuitive game that the entrepreneur has to be playing, which is I'm hearing all these different things from all these different customers. What is the commonality of what I should build, and what is the order of battle of how to, you know, what is the first thing to build, the second, the third, you know, et cetera. And I think that's, that can be a little more of an art than a, than a science, because then as you're learning those things, sometimes you have to sort of lead the customers to tell you about certain sorts of things. You know, we talked to five customers, and we think there's some commonality here, so now when we talk to the sixth customer, let's guide them in the direction of the commonality as opposed to sort of just letting them, you know, go off in the middle of nowhere, right? So I'm not sure if that answered your question, but. Ish? Maybe what, one or two more questions? Let's do it. Okay. Uh, my name's Adi. I was wondering what general advice do you have when uh, you're trying to hire your first few employees? Oh, gosh. Uh, hardest thing in the world. It is the hardest <laughs> thing in the world. I would say cultural fit is important. And in order to figure out what that is, you kind of have to sit down either with yourself or with your co-founder and figure out what your culture is going to be. And you may not know and you may get it wrong, but you've got to like, you got to put a stick in the sand somewhere and just basically say like, this is what we stand for. And this is what we have in common. You know, we really want people to come in and join us and be part of that. So for example, when we were at Ironport, Ironport had maybe what, 10 values. They were pretty easily to, easy to recite. Hey, maybe even only five. Maybe yeah. very, very, there is, the other thing is that we believed in them. So the, the, we, a lot of companies create values and then they put them up on the wall and, and no one can recite them and no one believes them. But one of the values at Ironport was, uh, it was a speak up culture. And obviously that could go awry if you speak up and they're like, oh, don't talk, sit down. You know, then obviously you're not living your culture. But at Ironport, we were encouraged to dissent. And however, there was another value, which was once you've dissented, if there's someone in leadership who takes your feedback and decides to do something else, you're supposed to rally behind the new idea. And then there was an open door policy, which was and then maniacal customer focus, et cetera. Those sorts of things helped us hire the right people. So when people come in and they see those values, they're like, I value customer service. I love being service oriented. I love this type of you know, culture they're going to feel like they've arrived at home. And so you have to build the container for them and the home for them before you hire that first employee. And you may not know, but maybe that first employee is gonna help you define that. Um, but I guarantee every person you add changes your business. And you have to be careful because culture can exist without your input. So if you don't get involved with it, it will just grow a life of its own and then once it does and you're really big and it's not the right one, you're screwed. Uh, blue, oh gosh, do I have to yeah, flip a coin? Do, <laughs> Let's take both of those and then we'll be done. Okay. okay um, Scott, you're somebody that's, I think, known for not being a very public person. Um, you know, you're not on a lot of social media, you don't do a lot of speaking engagements. I think <laughs> the, the fact that you're here today is a, is a surprise, of course. Surprise. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's a good surprise. <laughs> Um, but I'm just curious about you know what the personal philosophy or what the thesis is behind I guess that decision to to not be in the public very much. 
Wow. Is that something you accomplished? Wow. That's a great question. I mean, I, I think it's kind of multifaceted. I think when, specifically when it comes to social media, you know, I was on social media for a while. Um, His account was hijacked. No, but I quit before that, which is how it became hijacked because I wasn't paying attention to it. Okay. Um, uh, I, I came to believe that it wasn't, that it was, an, it was adding negative value to my life, if that, if that makes sense. Um, and so no amount of, oh, this will help me make money was worth the cost of this is adding negative value to my life. Now, I'm sure other people make different trade-offs. Um, I obviously, you know, have the privilege of being able to shut that off and have my career can, you know, continue because it was it predated that. Um, uh, and people used social media in different ways. And for some people, it may be positive rather than negative. But just specifically for me, um, uh, it just the, it was just a net. It was a net negative. Um, I would say more generically that I um, am just not very. I, uh, I think it, my, my ideal is sort of that no one knows who I am, but I can still do things, right? And that you can never quite have that fully, right? Because if you're, if you're doing things, then people are going to know who you are, right? But um, I'd be happy if no one knew who I was, right? So um, it's sort of the opposite of being a celebrity, I guess, right? Like people who are celebrities, you know, they have to deal with everyone knowing who they are and then what success to get out of that, who, who knows? I'm trying to kind of have the inverse of, of, of that, if that makes sense. I think sense. the other, I'm gonna chime in a little bit. I think Scott will do what's right and what's good because it's right and good, where a lot of people will do it because they want the social capital of the act. And this is a person who will never do that. And um, I find it very beautiful. It's actually one of the most beautiful things that I admire about this man is that he will go out there and, and do things that are world changing that nobody knows about. And it's because he wants all of our lives to be better and the world to be better and it's not about him. And so, you know, I, I've seen times where the Wall Street Journal had him on the front page and he wouldn't come out of the house for a week because he didn't want anybody to see it or, you know, um, he wouldn't read it. I think to this day you haven't read it. I haven't read it. So I think um, it's, it's admirable because it goes back to the ego you know, when, when um, there's some people that you see them on Twitter and you know who I'm talking about where they've got the 47 unicorns next to their name listed and, and they can't shut up. And, you know, and it's, it's, they're in it for a different reason and they're successful, but, you know, I think, I think this is a much more admirable way to go. So if you're looking towards being an investor someday or starting a company or changing the world, you might want to ask yourself, like, how will you be perceived uh, what is your brand? Uh, kind of like culture, it'll exist with or without you. <laughs> so. Thank you. All right, last question. Yeah, so I feel like, um, at least for me, I've heard that a lot of people use this phrase, like living in the future. Um, so like, I guess in your opinion, like, what are some concrete ways to put yourself in that mindset of like, thinking about these things like 10, 15, 20 years from now? Sure, yeah, if you can afford it, I highly recommend traveling. So one of the things I used to do was go to Japan and go someplace where ideally you don't speak the language and observe. How are people moving? How are they consuming? How are they getting around? What's different than where you are? And start, like Japan's particularly interesting because like they have things like escalators that don't move unless you go near them. You know, we don't have that. And so you think about that, that's energy preservation, right? Or they do things because they, um, they have a very different culture, but they have to live harmoniously within very close like proximity to one another in Tokyo. Same thing in Hong Kong, et cetera. So I think really just putting yourself out there to where you're present. You know, you're not taking phone calls, you're not on Instagram, you're not doing it for the TikTok reel or whatever. Like you're actually there to learn about human beings and how they operate in the world. You'll start noticing that in Japan, like they, they adopted the QR code. When did I come home going on and on and on about QR codes? How long ago was that? I can't remember. 15 years ago? Yes. Okay. Cyan was very into QR codes. I'm still into QR codes. Before anyone here. I have a side project them. doing QR code stuff. But anyway, so I'm really into QR codes and I've been waiting for a day and the pandemic was its day. All of a sudden, everybody can now look at a menu and, and but Japan's been doing it for 15 years. 
They've been watching television on their phones since way before we were. And so I think, but in many ways, they're living in the past. So you can say, wow, like they have these 50s cultural values, but then they, they solve for these density problems by living in the future. And then you can start thinking, gosh, what, can, what of these things could work in America or where I am? And then you start thinking about, you know, read science fiction. So that's the other thing is I, I feel like people don't read enough science fiction because if you, and then remember when the, the book was written. So if you're going to read two science fiction books, I recommend Snow Crash and Diamond Age. And when you read them, remember what year they were written. And then, then think about how Neil Stevenson saw the future. So who is Neil Stevenson today? Like, who is the next Neil Stevenson? Um, but interestingly, science fiction predicts the future over and over and over again, and they end up becoming true. Like, Neil Stevenson predicted the iPad, Meta, you know, uh, VR, um, and the guy is a Luddite. He hates technology. He doesn't understand it. Like, if you talk to him, he's just like, I don't know. He hates his fans. It's the weirdest thing. <laughs> but obviously, there's some sort of, once you get your mind tuned to that sort of thing, the ideas just start to come, and you start living in the future. That's all I can really say. That's, um, and then you'll find yourself on that frontier, and it's a really fun place to be. What was the second book? Diamond Age and Snow Crash. Now, Neil Stevenson cannot start a book or end a book. So when you read Diamond Age, there's a really annoying character in the beginning. He dies. So interestingly, I tried to read this book for years. And then when Scott and I first started dating, he was asking me about my favorite books and stuff. And I said, Diamond Age, or sorry, I said Snow Crash. And he's like, well, have you read Diamond Age? I'm like, no, there's this really annoying guy. And he's like, oh, he dies. So I'm doing you all a favor. I think his name is Bud. Spoiler alert. Yeah, spoiler alert. They, he spends 10 pages building up this character that gets blown away. And it, it has stopped so many people from reading this book because he's such an annoying character. And you think that he's going to be pervasive around. But no, he's dead. So he's just to establish one thing only, which is he's the father of somebody. That's it. Um, Further spoiler alert, you really didn't need to go that far. But. Darth Vader is Luke's father. <laughs> um, but I recommend reading these types of things. What is your favorite science fiction book? Heinlein, oh, right? I mean... I don't know. I like a lot of them. I would hate Give to us pick one. A, I would hate to pick a favorite. The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. Uh, that's a good one. There you go. Stranger in a Strange Land. Stranger okay, strange fine. Land. I like Heinlein. It's, it's okay, true. Okay, Heinlein. Um, but I think that uh, people don't hand, they hand Jack Welch books to people and management books and things like that and, you know, zero to one, but they don't hand somebody a science fiction novel. And I really wish people would do that more because that's, that's how you're going to start dreaming about what's possible. Thank you for spending date night with all of us. Yeah. This is awesome. We've only <laughs> We've only done this three times and twice with you. I appreciate so, it. So it's pretty exciting. <laughs> so the, this is rare, to your point. Uh, Scott does not make appearances very often, and we especially do not make them together. And um, it's actually by design, because you see his personality, you see what he likes to be like, and so I'm the public face a lot of the time. Um, but we, it works for us, and it allows them to conserve energy, and I get fired up by it, and then we reconnect at home, and it's, it's really great. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks for coming out. Yeah. Thank you.